welcome to the Zoo Crew Recovery Life Podcast. Today we have Mr. Eric in Florida sharing his experience, strength, and hope with us, and here to tell us what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. So without further ado, I give you Eric in Florida. Go ahead, Eric, it's all yours. Well, hey, everyone. I've got quite a story to share. It's been 17 years worth. And around 11, I realized there was something different about me. I was the most anxious kid and, well, got suggested to me, try drinking. Picked up the bottle and I never put it down. But my whole life I've always kept up with my health. I did ate right, exercised, and I thought that the health problems would never get me, but around year 15, I got that toothache in your pancreas, and I ignored it. Then started having episodes of swelling, and I ignored it. Turns out, managed to drink myself into kidney failure. And I didn't know, so I just kept going. I found God about three years ago, but I was still drinking. And what happened with me is at a certain point, I just couldn't. I couldn't keep living that way. And well, I had been recommended to AA a couple thousand times. I think we can all identify with that one. So I picked up the big book and gave it a read. And every word is true. It it really, it really calls us out. <laughs> so I started going to meetings and they started calling me white chip because every time I'd go to the meeting, I'd need another one. But I kept going. Whether or not I was still drinking, I was going to keep going because there's help there. And not long ago, it's been coming on four months. I stopped entirely. I, I managed to finally let go. And the best piece of advice I have is the full surrender. Just like it says, just like it says, the way to give in, the way to give in to God's will is just realize that you are acting selfishly. Every alcoholic is by nature selfish. We are disregarding everyone around us and the impact it has on their lives. And we're disregarding our place in the world for alcohol. Now, I can tell you that the thing that brought me to the bottle is PTSD. I recognize that now because I started analyzing, why do I drink? What are the things that make me drink? I realized those are all things that remind me of John, would you mind if I told a more personal story? It is your story, sir. You know, I'm sure you know you have a. Uh, yeah, it, it is your story, and uh, you know, just stick with the traditions. So feel free to go wherever you need okay. to. All right. Well, the thing that happened with me is I have a couple beautiful daughters, and. We had gone to a new rental house, this beautiful split level, and the landlord lived upstairs. Landlord said they had a dog and it was friendly and good with kids. First day there, I took took the kid up to the bathroom and two pit mastiff fighting dogs latched on to both of us. And it it took a massive swath of her face up and it left me disabled from what I've always done. And it was months of both of us in the hospital trying to get back from that. I mean, I won the fight, but it didn't feel like it. And well, during that, it's always hard on relationships and that sort of thing happens. During that, my wife left me too. I ended up with no one and nothing. My only friend was my old friend in the bottle. And it would get rid of the night terrors. It would stop me from remembering for a little while. And there was no one around to stop me. So that's when I finally hit rock bottom. Somewhere, somewhere into drinking myself into homelessness, I found myself in jail too. And 
I got out of jail and without learning a single thing, kept drinking. Rock bottom for me came one day, I was drinking red wine straight out of those gallon Carlo Rossi jugs. And I couldn't drink anymore. I was drinking and then throwing right up. My body was telling me something was wrong. And that's when I found out I was in kidney failure. So I had to stop, but I really, well, as it says, powerless. I really was powerless to stop. And while I was in the hospital, that's when I started reading the big book. And well, it took me a long time to quit after that. It took me many months of just going to meetings, reading, trying to work on trying to work on the steps as best I could. Don't give up. Quitting is a process. It's it's like when you go on a diet. There's diets don't work. You need lifestyle change. We can all quit on our own willpower for a month or two. But without the 12 steps, you are going to return to it. And like the big book says, and if we drink, we will surely die. It's, it's a matter of recognizing that the way you used to live life is not a way you can continue. There is, there is no way to compromise and well, I'll just drink a little. That's just not, it's not possible for an alcoholic. The best piece, the best piece of advice for quitting long term is whether whatever your higher power is, whenever the urges come up for me, I pray and I pray to give my cares over to that higher power. And you'll find that it might take you a little bit, but eventually that is the magic words that whisk away all the pain. It's uh, another piece of advice is charity. Step 12 is all about sharing the message to other alcoholics. And that's, that's everything because it's what keeps you going is if you're helping other people, you're also helping yourself. Mm. I don't know where I'm going, John. Uh, what do you think? Uh, Eric, just speak from the heart, man. What it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. How, how old are you, oh. Eric? I am 29. Okay, so young. 29, 29 but with 17 years in. Tell us what brought you into AA at such a young age and uh, why, why are you still here? Well, what it was like for me is I've always said that addiction is taking something you used to enjoy and making it your personal hell. Uh, David Foster Wallace said, doing the substance now is like attending black mass. You are doing something horrible and you know it and you can't stop. I, I was, it, I always describe it like I was watching a train wreck in slow motion, powerless to stop it. But that powerlessness is step one. I was a gifted student my whole life. I had a bright future at one point, but I was drinking young too. I ended up managing to get to college. And I only dropped out because I got drunk and decided to run away with the girl behind me in class and go start a farm. And working on a farm, there was no longer anything to stop me from drinking. So I drank that marriage away. Uh, you know, it's, you just can't, you can't focus on anyone else while you're focusing on feeding a habit like that. And that's another, that's another thing I can really say is don't live for yourself. Alcohol is a selfish disease. You got to live for other people. And well, I found my current wife and that definitely helped. And through all my drunken antics, she stood by me and well, she looked into Al-Anon. 
And that support system of someone who also knows what's going on was really helpful. What what brought me to AA, I suppose, is always trying to quit on my own willpower, doing good for a month or two, and then failing. There's just there's just no way to do it. If I would say that AA is about the only way that I could have quit. And my experience coming to AA was amazing because I found that I was able to tell my darkest secrets with other people who had similarly dark secrets. And my step four list is a mile long. Over the course of 17 years, I managed to burn just about every bridge I had ever made. And still you don't stop. No matter you another thing the big book says, you can't remember the humiliation of just a month or two ago. It it just adds on to the list of things that make you drink to forget it. Uh, another David Foster Wallace, one David Foster Wallace had said. Said, oh yeah, you drink to kill the pain. Oh yeah, you drink for relief of the pain of the losses your love of that relief caused. The more the more you lose to it, the more you give to it. Alcohol is like having a it's like having a parasite almost. You're just feeding that thing's interests instead of your own. But after coming to AA, I realized that I was not alone in this and that there's an entire society of people who have had the same problem. And boy, if I haven't heard everyone's story about how they quit for a few months, if you manage, if you manage to quit, that shows that you really don't want to do it, but when you go back to it, it shows that there is something something physically wrong. You need what they call the spiritual experience. That paradigm shift. And I don't know what to I don't know what'll do it for you, but what did it for me is realizing that God has a plan for me. God has a plan for every one of us. And the thing that gets in the way of that plan is us trying to tamper with it. Alcoholism is a disease of seeking control. You're trying to make your life tiny and controllable. It's all in the big book, but you're trying to make life tiny and controllable so you don't have to think about any of the things that are driving you into the bottle. I'm of the opinion, and I've done addiction counseling a lot, I'm of the opinion that everyone with an addiction has some kind of trauma that they're fighting off. Like, it's if every story I hear, oh, yeah, well, I guess my trigger is this horrible thing that happened to me or that horrible thing that happened to me. Yeah, and you just keep giving yourself more traumas as you drink. But what it's like now is I'm 29 and I just bought my first home. I have a fulfilling life. I have a wife and kids again. And I even am in a good enough place that my mom's able to come live with me. I'm, I'm finally, I'm finally fulfilling God's plan for me. And it's there for you too. It's, there's something for everyone. There's something meant for everyone that you are better than alcohol for. Um, day to day living one day at a time, like they say. Day to day, I still have cravings and I still have those bad memories. But what I do is I meditate, give my cares over to God, and if it really comes down to it and you feel like you're about to drink, call your sponsor because they will shoot down every rationalization you're trying to make. There is no good reason you want to drink. You're just coming up with them. I don't know. I, I drink because something good happened. I drink because something bad happened. I drink because I'm bored. <laughs> there's there's a myriad of reasons you'll come up with, but all of them are just the disease trying to lie to you. It just will do anything to get that back into your brain. 
but never, never surrender. It is, it is better to die on your, on your feet than live on your knees. Just fighting alcoholism is doing battle with your inner demons daily. And the only way to get through it is to never give up. You fall off the horse once or twice, you get right back on it. Like I had a relapse. I had a relapse and it lasted for two days, the shortest one of my whole career, entirely because you look and it's just the first, it's just the first couple chapters of the big book playing itself over in front of you. You go, oh, wow, this, this is a very, this is a very uh, easily predictable disease. You do the same things, everybody does them. And there's really, I don't know, the only way that anyone manages to live with alcoholism is by living in denial, which is why at the meetings we immediately identify ourselves with, I'm an alcoholic. And I guess, I guess that about, that about covers me. What do you think, John? Oh, Eric, it's your story, and if you're good, you, if you're good with it, I'm good with it. All right. Well, I thank you for having me. Uh, I appreciate it, man. Enjoy the rest of your day, Eric. Thank you. You too.